today's program is called The Farmer's Lawyer. And I will tell you a little bit about her. Sarah Vogel is an attorney, advocate, and author of The Farmer's Lawyer, a memoir about the landmark class action suit, Coleman versus Block. She brought and won this historic case against the federal government on behalf of 240,000 family farmers facing foreclosure during the 1980s farm crisis. Along with advocating for the family farmers, women, and Native Americans, Vogel served two terms as North Dakota Commissioner of Agriculture, the first woman to be elected to this position in any state. Please help me welcome Sarah Vogel. Um, anyway, it, it's really wonderful to be here, and I gotta say it's wonderful, wonderful to follow Bill Pratt. I have to tell a Bill Pratt story. Um, I, I lived in I live in Bismarck, and um, I knew Bill Pratt because of his work on re researching farm protests and uh, holiday association and nonpartisan league and stuff like that. And I happened to be brought up into the nonpartisan league brought up in the nonpartisan league party. Well, I'll tell you about in a little bit. But um, at this point in time, I was remodeling my house and I was changing the second floor around. And in my attic, I had boxes and boxes and boxes and boxes of papers that I had been collecting during the 1980s. And I think this was maybe mid to late 90s maybe even the early 2000s, I can't remember. But I had to do something with these boxes. And then, honest to God, Bill Pratt knocks on the door. I wasn't expecting him. And he pops in, and he's just come back from Bow Bells, where he'd been researching the Communist Party. Um, and he told me some stories about the Communist Party in Bow Bells, a tiny little town in northwestern North Dakota. And they had the local newspaper, and I also lament that we're losing our local newspapers. But the local newspaper in the society column, like they used to have the late, you know, where they say, Mrs. So-and-so and Mrs. So-and-so and Mrs. So-and-so went over to so-and-so's house and they had cookies and brownies and served nuts on the side and little cups, you know, that, that kind of notice. And only in Bow Bells it was the Communist Party met at Mrs. So-and-so's house. <laughs> <laughs> So he was able to research the Communist Party by the gathering of the little ladies groups, you know. I mean, like, what a hoot. Um, so I, le I, would tell, you know, I told him about my, my problem with these boxes of papers. And I had a feeling that I had one of the best collections of material on the 80s farm depression that anybody had. Um, not just because of the lawsuit, but because of the time I spent as an assistant attorney general the time I spent as agriculture commissioner where I was working on, you know, the ending the farm crisis. I was elected ag commissioner of North Dakota in 1988. And um, what to do with it. And Bill said, the North Dakota archives at the State Historical Society would love to have them. And, and I was just stunned. It had never occurred to me. So we, I think Bill called the archivist and in like 10 minutes, th they were over there and they had a pickup truck and they were delighted. And that's where they are today. I have 99 boxes of materials at the North Dakota archives. It's called the Sarah Vogel archives and it covers um, the 80s farm foreclosure. It's got stuff in there that my grandfather who was in the NPL, some of his stuff, my father who was U.S. Attorney, some of his stuff, but mostly it's mine, and mostly it was massively disorganized, and many boxes pertain to this case called the Coleman Coleman versus Block. Um, and as the 80s, the the case raged from, I would say, work on it started in '82, undercover. We didn't want the feds to know we were what we were up to exactly. And then it was in court from 82, 80, I mean 83, 84, 85. And then 
basically a second lawsuit was filed um, that addressed, sued USC a second time as they tried to get around the results we got in the first case. And then it finally ended in 1987. But then many of the parts of the injunctions that we were able to get were put into permanent law by Congress. And that was in the 87 Ag Credit Act. And I got a brag, but they called the reforms to the USDA hearing process the Coleman reforms. And I, I must say that really, you know, makes me feel good, but the, it's the origins of today's National Appeals Division. Um, and I could talk more about that, but we'll, uh, the cover of my book um, has a picture of, of me and um, a falling down barn and two of the clients I was working with. And the photograph was taken by Gray Villette, who was a famous, famous uh, Life magazine photographer. Um, in the 80s, there was a lot of interest in the farm crisis, crisis by you know, the coastal press. And I would typically get phone calls saying, I'm from you know, the Baltimore Press, or I'm from Washington Post, and I'm going to come out and watch a foreclosure or take a, take a video of a foreclosure and then go back and do a story. And I would scream at them, you know, like, I fight foreclosures. <laughs> I don't want foreclosures. Foreclosures don't happen on the farm. Foreclosures happen at the front step of the courthouse or inside an office. Um, so anyway, the one, one day, though, I got a call from a reporter from Life magazine, and he said, will you introduce me to farmers who are having troubles? And so I said, of course. So he came, they came out. It was um, a reporter and a photographer, and they stayed for a long time. And then finally, they circled back and said, could they do the story about me working with the farmers? So that was in Life magazine in November of 82. And then that's when the phone really started to ring. But um, I'm also glad I'm following Bill today because he was talking about the nonpartisan league and the Farm Holiday Association, which are things that I grew up with hearing about. Uh, my grandfather was the campaign manager, the different title then, for Governor Langer, who issued the famous foreclosure moratorium uh, in 1933. And the Farm Holiday Association was very active in North Dakota. And, and I had done a paper in college about the Holiday Association. So I'd gone, finished gone to law school at New York University. I'd come back to North Dakota just at the be, not at the beginning, beginning, but the, when the eight, I moved back to North Dakota in 1981, 82. And the phone started to ring. And, but after that Life Magazine story, it got really intense. And at first we thought that we could persuade the federal government, which was the Farmers Home Administration, to back off. But we soon found we could not. And the reason is that the, the Farmers Home Administration was set up, as, as Bill said, in the, in, the 19, in the 1930s to basically help farmers, to help rural residents, to help sharecroppers. And but by 1982, and, and over those years, it had done incredible work. It had lent money to many, many farmers for decades, hard times and bad, tiny fraction of a loss rate. And many farmers had gone on to graduate from USDA loans and uh, go to regular, it's a, it's a beautiful program. But in 19, um, 88, uh, President Reagan 
uh, had, or 19, excuse me, I'm getting all my years mixed up. Um, when President Reagan was elected, he appointed people who hated Farmer's Home to be the head of Farmer's Home, a guy by the name of Charles Schumann, who was the son of the president of the National Farm Bureau who wanted to get rid of Farmer's Home. And so they set up a, they set up a thing called a foreclosure, a delinquency reduction goal, which was a quota. And every state was told to eliminate delinquencies by about 25% in a matter of months during 81, 82, 82, 83. And the way, only way you could get rid of a delinquency in the fall of a year was to call a loan, sell the cattle, sell everything off, shut the farm down. And they were told, um, and they also had something that had been set up in the early days to help people who didn't know how to manage bank accounts. They were called supervised bank accounts. And the uh, farmer's home was a co-signator on those accounts. And the way it happened was that the farmer would go to town, maybe write a check, maybe for health insurance, which happened, or groceries, or bills, and it would come back bounced because the Farmers Home Administration had emptied the bank account. And this was, they starved the farmer off the farm. They would not let the farmer have any more money from the milk checks, from the sale of crops. The money from the bank account was gone. And they were told, they were given the reasons, which often included something like, you're a bad manager, You've operated the farm in a husband-like manner, or something like that. And then they were told they would tell the farmers that you could have a hearing in six to eight weeks, and the hearing would be before the very person that had signed off on the foreclosure. That was the system. And you know, I was I was a lawyer, and I thought that this was impossibly bad. It was unconstitutional. Um, it was unfair. And so, but in order to sue the federal government, you have to exhaust administrative remedies. So we had to go through that horrible, horrible system with the biased hearing officers. You know, the farmers were starved out. And by the way, none of them could pay me a thing. I had just moved back to North Dakota, bought a house. <laughs> And uh, all of a sudden, all of my clients were flat broke farmers. And they would bring me food. Um, they'd give me gas when I went to their farms. But um, I was as broke as they were. Um, but we, we worked together. The subtitle of the book is The North Dakota Nine and the Fight to Save the Family Farm. And the North Dakota Nine were my, what the people who ended up being my lead plaintiffs on a class action. All of the farmers were being treated the same, which made it a very uh, good uh, class action option because the class action involves people who were treated the same and of course the defendant was the same and the process was the same. But, you know, naturally being in debt um, being delinquent, facing foreclosure, is nothing people really want to talk about. I, I, I had clients who would say, um, come to my office, ask me for advice, write me letters and stuff like that. And then they'd say, P.S., would you mind not putting your name on the return address? Because <laughs> they didn't want the postman to know they were even working with me. So, I mean, it's sensitive. I mean, if you ask a rancher how many cows they have, they may not tell you. And here I was asking people to stand up and, you know, bear all their troubles. And these, these nine did. And they said, it might be too late 
to save my farm, but if I can stop this from happening to somebody else, I will do it. And that's what they did. This is the story of how we did the lawsuit, the troubles we had. Um, uh, yeah, I'm getting emotional. <laughs> and, um, and how we won at the end, thanks to a, a, a marvelous judge. Other lawyers stepped up to the plate. I hope that if young lawyers read this, they can see that sometimes it's possible to start something that is that you know you can't handle, or maybe you're naive, which naivete is a great weapon, just <laughs> the best. If you're naive, that's, that's pretty good, because, um, it, you know, anyway, it helped me a lot. <laughs> I, I just never thought how bad it could get. Um, but it, um, but people came, came and helped at, at key times. Um, earlier when Bill was talking, he had a picture of Denise O'Brien, uh, uh, who was down at Prairie Fire Rural Action. And there was this big network of, of, of people, not so much the established farm organizations, they weren't all that helpful. Um, but these young upstart farm associations uh, were, were, did step up and were great. Um, Prairie Fire Rural Action was one and, and there were others. Um, people would meet and get together and I was always on the verge of quitting. Um, but I would go to one of these meetings of these little advocate of our advocacy groups coordinated by Mark Ritchie. And, um, and I'd say, I, I came to tell you in person I'm quitting. And they would go, da, 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 da. And I were like, OK, <laughs> I would go back and keep at it. Um, but it was, it was a lot of drama. And um, at the end of the day, um, we were able to stop cold turkey, 16,000 cases that were already in court and tens of thousands more who are in the pipeline heading for foreclosure. And ultimately, we held the, the government off. These were not easy times, but we held the government off until the 87 Farm Credit Act came in to um, basically provide opportunities for restructuring and all kinds of relief, because otherwise, otherwise, the entire U.S. economy was going to fall based on the importance of agriculture. The farm credit banks, and who's invested in the farm credit banks? It'd be big insurance companies. So insurance companies, savings and loans, it was all going to crash. And that's why the 87 Farm Credit Act was adopted. Um, but, you know, which wasn't perfect, but it did stop the slide. And during this period, also, the, um, the, there were like hundreds and hundreds of people who became farm advocates, which is really not on, like, very close to the work that the Farm Holiday did back in the 30s. Um, the Farm Holiday Association had a lot of leaders that were from, from North Dakota. And they would go from being the head of the Farm Holiday Association to be U.S. Senator. <laughs> <laughs> back then, that was Usher Burdick. Um, so, and then his son Quentin Burdick was being very helpful to us as we did this case. Um, so, uh, he was also a U.S. senator. So it was. Uh, There's a lot of drama, and during in the years that followed, I remained kind of busy. You know, I got I was an assistant attorney general. I spent most of my time fighting the posse comitatus. And then, and then when I became agriculture commissioner, I was pretty busy. And then I was back in private law practice, and I was did more lawsuits uh, against big corporations and big government, and sometimes even the state of North Dakota, uh, federal government. And uh, and then when I started, this was about uh, about 10, 11 years ago. I thought. I really wanted to write a book about this because I felt I had the feeling or like a premonition that there what if there's another farm crisis 
You know, what if people have forgotten the lessons of the 30s, the lessons of the 80s? What if this happens again? And so I thought I would write a book about this case. And uh, it took, it took l roughly uh, 10 years to get it written. Seven of, w seven of those years I spent organizing my papers. <laughs> I, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but not by much. Um, and then three years writing it, and it came out in November. And it's, it's doing well. It's gotten some awards. I have, a, I have an endorsement by John Grisham, um, who thought it was like a real life John Grisham story. Um, and um, so it's, it's been quite a ride, but the reason why I wrote it is I do not want another 1980s, 1930s farm crisis to happen again. And I hope this helps in that process. So um, what, have it, what else have I forgotten? I can't remember. But maybe people have questions or we could have a discussion. Yeah. I grew up on a small southeast South Dakota farm in the my great grandfather's homestead. And my parents uh, were able to hold on to a quarter section after years of homestead. Sometime in the 60s, I don't know exactly when, with, uh, with an F-8 sable. Yeah. Flash forward a few years to the period you're talking about, the 80s. Now, Dad hadn't expanded, but my mom went back to teaching. He was in farm. They did job on the side, but they were able to hold on that quarter because the farm had F-8 sable. But he was quite resentful with, of the way a lot of people, in his view, a lot of his neighbors, some of them who were his friends, had profited from speculation section. That was the way he looked at it. They had bought in the run up, if you know the whole history, the yeah. Russians going into the wheat market and so forth. The prices soared in the late uh, 80s until the, the late 70s, I should say, yeah. until they crashed. And a number of his friends and neighbors had expanded during that period mm -hmm. on the assumption that the prices will stay up. Well, then, for the whole process we're talking about, eventually, a lot of them had those notes written down yeah. and held on to that money. And yeah. essentially, it gives you the speculators what? That they, yeah. they speculated. Those who hadn't speculated were left poor or lower middle. And so how do you, how, how do you address that? I 100% agree with your dad. And I'll tell you what happened is that the people that were fighting on the side of the family farmers, we wanted the relief of the 87 Farm Credit Act to be limited to people who would be no larger than family farm, farm size when they emerged. So if somebody had borrowed, and they had opened it up to guaranteed loans from banks, which is a whole different story than the original core loan programs of, of the original farm home. but. Um, what I was told at the time was that it had gotten so bad, and if the farm credit institutions went down, then they would be taking the insurance companies down, and the whole economy would go back into something exactly like the early 30s when there was a con not just a farm crisis, but a, a, a countrywide crisis. And that was the decision made by Congress. That had nothing to do with the lawsuit I brought. Yeah, I wasn't singling out your lawsuit. Yeah. I'm talking about the macro. Yeah, yeah, the macro. But um, that, that's, that's too bad that it happened that way. But I think that's also an instruction to let's not let it get that bad <laughs> this time through. So that um, if there is relief, uh, if people need relief, it could be targeted. Um, like right now in Congress, there's, um, well, I guess it's been passed, but there's relief for distressed, you know, but it's limited in size. Um, so, but yeah, that was, that was sort of a, a legacy of the 80s that was kind of unpleasant but and people used to blame me 
you know, which I thought, uh, I said, no, that was Congress. And that law was signed by Ronald Reagan. Not, you know, I had nothing to do with that law. I mean, what we wanted, what we wanted was the debt to give people time. And, and they did have some very nice uh, programs so that if, if the land had devalued, let the person who was on the farm stay on the farm after the devaluation because otherwise what was happening is that the, the, the farmer whose fault it was not that the land had devalued would be kicked off the farm or it would go to a bank and then the bank would sell it to somebody else for a low price. So why not let, let the farmer who's already there continue? But it would have been better, I think, if they had limited it to people emerging from this catastrophic thing to be no larger than family size farms. There would have been more openings and opportunities for younger farmers, for example. But yeah, that, you, that's, a, that's a part of the 80s I remember well. <laughs> But it was all Ronald Reagan's fault. <laughs> <laughs> yes, my family was not in farming, but we had my dad had a car dealership in a small town, and you know we were devastated. Yeah. You know, and it was right when I was wanting to go to college, and it was extremely, extremely hard financially to right. keep going and and just. Witness the devastation of all, you know, a lot of people moved away. They lost their farms and moved away. And, you know, how did you keep going in, in the face of all that sadness? Um, it was the farmers who kept me going. They, uh, you know, I, I, yeah, I had I had a lot of, uh, <laughs> but I found that the farmers and their connection to the land was such that, and and their connection to a sense of justice, um, and and as long as they would keep at it, I could keep at it. You know that was kind of how it went. I I remember I would be at the verge of. Be, be super, super depressed. And I uh, really wonder how, how can I keep going here, you know? And, um, and then I would get a call from Dwight Coleman, uh, who was the lead plaintiff, and he'd, say, he'd just say, hey, Sarah, how are you doing? <laughs> and, uh, and then I realized, you know, I'm working for them. And I didn't tell them about the troubles I was going through because that would have sent them into, you know, I don't know, you know, but. But um, but they they provided hope and encouragement and their 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 attachment to the land their attachment to um, to their farms their conviction that they had done nothing wrong that they had done everything right and and their the con commitment to their animals for example they wanted to take care of their animals um, and so that was that's what kept me going. And, and then I had lawyers who came in to help too, Alan Canner, Bert Newborn, my father. Um, and they, they, we, they added a lot, of, a lot of fun and humor and great writing and research to the whole process. So it was, it was all in all good. And then we had um, like one of my best moments that I remember, and I, I think I, have, I had a transcript of it, so it's in the book. Um, the, we won the preliminary injunction, and then the judge called called my father and I because we were local. The others were on the east east coast, and uh, we had we had a meeting with the uh, Department of Justice lawyers, and the judge sat us down on his table and he said, "Well, now," he said, "Well, here we have this case," and on. Um, one side, we've got the government, we've got USDA, we've got the Department of Justice, and on the other side, we have the victims. <laughs> it's in the transcript, and I go, well, okay. <laughs> we can make this work, and my dad and I just 
look at each other like, well, all right, you know, but we had a good judge who had a sense of justice. And he's the one who coined the word, the phrase, the North Dakota Nine, by the way, because it was like many years later, um, I, I guess 1999, uh, he called, because he was a super ethical guy. He was no visiting, you know. Um, but uh, he called and said, let's have, a, have lunch. So I had lunch with him and his secretary, and he'd been invited to write a, uh, an article for a judge's magazine about this case, because it was, it was a pretty big deal. And, um, and he wanted to know what had happened to the North Dakota Nine. I said, who are the North Dakota Nine? And he looked at me and said, well, they're your lead plaintiffs. I said, where'd that come from? He said, well, during the trial, I kept thinking that they were like the Chicago Seven. <laughs> because, you know, they were, they, were, they were in their own way as radical as the Chicago Seven. And, uh, I mean, they were sticking up for the Constitution. You know, and they were, they were just farmers, and they were, they come into court, and they were like, you know, wearing their church clothes and but they, they were you know I never connected them to the Chicago Seven but brave yes and were they sure that they were right yes and then you know many years later and we mostly lost touch but when as I was writing the book I, I got in touch with all of those that were still alive um, and um, and none of them had any regrets and the McCabe said this is the best thing we ever did and um, Russell Falmer had died, um, but he put it in his obit, <laughs> along with being the, you know, all the other things that people put into obits. He put in that he was the plaintiff in this case. So they were great, but they, they are the ones who kept me, who kept me going and motivated. Farmers are the best clients, I gotta say. They really are. That's what I've done most of my career is work with farmers, and um, they're they're wonderful to work with. Another question? Oh, sorry. I just was wondering what happened to the North Dakota um, nine and those that were um, foreclosed on uh, under the old system that was in the Oh. Well, one thing that happened is most of them were, uh, you know, what, the land, land debt does not mess a farm's operations up, that mess you up very much, because that, that's typically long-term, and all the clients had long-term loans, which is the bulk of the money that they owed. And then the operating debt is the, the money that farmers would typically get you know, to plant in the spring, or feed cattle, and, and so on. And what happened is that local banks mostly came to the rescue and, and started to finance these farmers. They were good farmers. Um, they, they, they had delinquencies, but it's not because they weren't farming well. It was because of either disaster or just low prices, and it was unavoidable. And um, so the local bankers uh, came, and during the 80s, by the way, I never had any troubles with local bankers. In North Dakota back then, it was mostly local bankers. So, um, so that, that was, so they, they were able to keep on, and I wouldn't say life was easy, but when the 87 Egg Credit Act came in, and people were allowed to restructure. Most of them were able to restructure. Dwight Coleman got a, got a, a replacement loan from uh, another entity set up in the 80s called Rural Rehabilitation. They, there was a variety of things. The Falmers were with the Bank of North Dakota for their real estate, and the Bank of North Dakota eventually came around. I've got a chapter about us, and we had, a, we had a law in North Dakota then called the Confiscatory Price Law. It was a legacy of the Nonpartisan League and, uh, I guess, and the Holiday Association. And it, it said that whenever prices 
of farm products were confiscatory, the judges did not have to approve foreclosures, which didn't mean you're going to win, but it threw a wrench in the works. And what farmers wanted was time. They wanted another crop year. They wanted, they wanted to stay on the land. Um, so that confiscatory price law is beautiful. They've since repealed it, which is a terrible pity. Yes. Well, uh, my father, who was practicing law at that time, uh, he blamed Ronald Reagan, but he also blamed Jimmy Carter with media. Yeah. And how do you think the media about that? I think the wheat embargo um, probably caused the defeat of Jimmy Carter. Um, and um, I think he tried to, f when I look back on it, the economists who study it say that he put in a whole bunch of different da 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 to, uh, to raise prices back up from the wheat embargo. But the confidence of farmers in f their export markets was irreversibly lost with that wheat embargo. And Ronald Reagan lied through his teeth in that campaign. I pulled out the campaign materials when I researched this, because I, I consider this not just a memoir, but a history. Um, the Ronald, the, the 19, uh, the, the uh, what year was that? That would have been uh, 78, 80? 80. Yeah, the, the 1980 farm, pro, farm platform of the Republican Party, whew, thing of beauty. They promised every single thing you could imagine, completely based on smoke and mirrors. I mean, I don't think they had any intention, but that's what they, they said, all this great stuff. And the, the C Carter, said some of the great same stuff. He didn't lie like Reagan did, but the farmers had lost faith in, in Jimmy Carter, who actually was a farmer. And then the American Ag Movement, which was extremely, it's still around, but it's a shadow of its former self. But it, it, they, you know, they're the ones who organized the tractor caves. But one of the things that happened um, was that when the, in the second tractorcade, the uh, Congress passed this 1907 uh, U.S. Code 1983, the deferral law, which is the law that we used to stop farmers, farm foreclosures, because we, we didn't say forgive the debt, we didn't say delay the debt, we just said let the farmers apply for a deferral and they can show that they can pay it out over time, but let them apply. And the Reagan administration says, we're not even going to let them apply. And then that's what the judge enjoined. He said, until USDA allows them to apply for a deferral, they can't foreclose. Until USDA provides a constitutional hearing process, they can't foreclose. And then to our surprise, the Reagan administration refused to do either of those things. So they could have wrapped the case up in two months by giving due process, by letting farmers apply for deferral, but they didn't want to. So it was like sort of stuck. The injunction lasted like for four years and stopped foreclosures. And you know, that was good. <laughs> they, they, needed, they needed the time. But yeah, it was a big adventure and you know, probably but for this case, I would not have become Ag Commissioner. By the way, I was Ag Commissioner of North Dakota for eight years. I was only a woman Ag Commissioner for eight years. So it was me and 49 guys at these meetings. <laughs> so like, am I strong? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sarah, after so much, turmoil and the experiences you've been talking about. Why did you decide to try the political route and run for election? Well, that's an e the question was, after all this turmoil, why did I decide to run? And it was because 
I looked at the Office of Commissioner of Agriculture and I said, that person could be doing so much more than they're doing. And I thought that's how, that's how I can have an impact if I can get elected. And then, as Bill pointed out, North Dakota has a state-owned bank, a big, the biggest bank probably between the east and the west coast, or Minneapolis and Seattle. It's a huge bank. And that bank could do a ton of things to help farmers, and we did. We, we made all kinds of loans and workouts and this and that. Um, and then I would have all the egg mediators working for me. And I would be able to be on the uh, state mill. We have a state-owned mill that's going to celebrate its 100th anniversary in October. 100 years of a state-owned mill. And it's the biggest mill in North and South America, not North and South Dakota. North and South America, it's the biggest flour mill. It's like great. So, so I could be on these boards, I could be on, on these commissions, I could be on the Water Commission and get, get people like uh, support for water on their ranches. You know, there's, I wanted the power. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that's what I did. I, and I got elected and I, um, and it was, it was just, it was probably the best job I ever had. But in the nonpartisan league, they had, they, had, they had a position that there should not be like professional politicians. You should, if you're elected one, two, two times, you should go, that's enough. You, you'd become spoiled by the lobbyists and the railroads and this and that, you should leave and um, let somebody else come in. And um, that's what I did. So in my seventh year, I said I wouldn't run again. And that, I said it out loud to the press so that I couldn't change my mind. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.